So, we've read up to Acts chapter 18, verse 11, then continue through Thessalonians 1 and 2 to see Paul's work at the Corinth. In the second missionary, Paul went through Galatians, Philippi, and Macedonian region, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and encouragement from Jesus. Then Paul sent a letter to the local church in Thessalonica where he worked for three weeks in order to teach them some of the things they should expect after they believed in God and also what attitude they should have when living their life after salvation. The next step, obviously for those people saved by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, is to be with God forever and experience God's glory. That's why the attitude we take when living our lives is very important. Similar problems arose in Thessalonica at the time, so Paul wrote a letter to deal with their wrong attitudes and approaches in life and teach them the wisdom of life as Christians. So going back to Acts chapter 18, we'll look at some of the things that happened in Corinth. Normally, when we read the Bible in historical order, we read the Galatians after Thessalonians because the book Galatians has few different claims on the time period which it was written. Some scholars report AD 48 as the time when Galatians was written, which is after Paul's first mission trip, and also that it was written in Antioch. But there are other claims that this book was written in AD 53 in Ephesus or in AD 56 in Macedonia. And some critics claim that it was written in AD 60 when Paul was in Roman detention. So in order to understand the core message of the letters properly, we need to know the relationship between the sender and the recipient, and also the historical circumstances at the time. That's why we always look at when, where, who, to whom, and why the letter was written and sent. Uh, with the case of Galatians, because it does not have any influence on the fundamental values that we've been conveying, or the Christian doctrine itself, we will look further into the book Acts first and then come back to looking at the book Galatians. Also, because the book Acts seems to be more plausible in terms of more probable chronological biblical sequence as well. So continuing with Acts chapter 18, verse 12 and 13. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Here, Achaia refers to the Athens and Corinth regions, and this Gallio governor was very famous historically. Gallio is a brother of a Stoic philosopher named Seneca, who was also the teacher of Roman Emperor Nero. And such person came as the governor of Achaia when the governor general was newly appointed to Achaia and was not yet familiar with the work of the entire Achaia area nor the local situation. The Jews tried to get the governor to accept the demands. Just like how Jews took Jesus up to the emperor and ended Jesus on the cross, they're really good at using political situations to achieve whatever they want. So they tried this method with Paul too, but obviously failed with the governor, Gallio. Chapter 18, verse 14-15, Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. Even before Paul had the chance to say his part, the governor Gallio already grasped the situation and told the Jews to sort it out themselves. 
And the Jews tried to manipulate the governor, who probably wanted political stability at the time, but instead they were outsmarted by the governor. Jews always caused these religious quarrels wherever they gathered. However, Gallio knew about such ethnic characteristics of the Jews, so he stayed firm and took measures not to be politically involved in religious matters with them. So verse 16 and 17, so he drove them off, then the crowd that turned on Sosthenes and synagogue leader and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Gallio showed no concern or whatever. So the exiled Jews couldn't do anything to Paul. So they took the synagogue leader, Sosthenes, and beat him up. By causing these local problems, they tried their best to manipulate Gallio to get rid of Paul. But the governor obviously did not care at all. Looking at this governor, he is very different to the governor Pontius Pilate, who fell into the trap of Jews and ended up putting Jesus on the cross. But the Emperor Pontius Pilate was once a man of great fame. However, even the great governor couldn't control the Jews that easily. Historically, most governors governing the Jewish region had difficulty dealing with them. Even looking at the Old Testament, God also had difficulties dealing with the Jews too. So at the time, this governor, Pontius Pilate also knew that Jesus had no reason to die, but when Jesus put him forward, he acted indecisively and was manipulated by the Jew in fear of local revolt. So as a result, Jesus had to die on the cross, and even churches all over the world now say, suffered under Pontius, was crucified, died, and was buried up in the prayer until this day at the service. However, Gallio did not get caught up in the Jews in such crisis with firm determination. Verse 18, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at saint because of a vow he had taken. Paul did suffer a lot of difficulties when preaching in Corinth, but with the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit, Paul continued to spread the gospel and preach people about God's words for about a year and a half. However, just like from other cities, Paul was getting threatened too much that he left Corinth. And also, luckily, thanks to the governor, Gallio, Paul did avoid the threats, but it was no longer safe for him to stay anyway, so he left Corinth. And Paul sailed to Syria and headed to the Antioch church, which was placed, which was a place where he began his missionary. He stopped by a sanctuary to cut his hair as a ceremony that he achieved what he had wished for through this mission trip. Perhaps Paul made a Nazareth vow to God for a certain purpose in relation to his missionary work in Corinth. In Corinth, Paul was scared and he kept quiet in fear of all the troubles. So when Jesus visited to comfort him, Paul probably made a vow to achieve his ministry with stronger heart and determination. Originally, there were laws that needed to be followed when these vow periods were over. In that sense, Paul offered his head to God and offered sacrifices. In the book Numbers, chapter 6, verse 5, it was a custom not to cut your hair during the period of your dedication as a vow. So it seems that Paul had cut his hair for the first time at the end of the vow. Looking at the fact that Paul did follow Jews' old tradition and law, he did not oppose the whole law of God that Jews followed strictly. He was only against those laws, regulations and traditions that had nothing to do with God's will, that Jews were crazy about keeping it. So Paul left Corinth with Luke, Titus, Silvano, Priscilla and Aquila and all went to Ephesus. 
So verse 19 to 21, they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined, but as he left, he promised, I'll come back if it's God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. Ephesus was a place that Paul wanted to visit during his second missionary trip, but he couldn't. However, this time he was able to stop by on his way back. Even at Ephesus, while he was only there for a short period of time, he went from place to another, visiting the synagogues to preach rather than going for sightseeing. Obviously, there were always few people that responded to his preach and wanted him to stay longer, but Paul couldn't stay, so he promised next time. He was on his way back, returning from his second trip, and he knew that staying in Ephesus wasn't part of God's plan, so he went to Jerusalem to complete his second mission trip, but he left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. Verse 22, when he landed at... He went to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and they went down to Antioch. So returning to Antioch meant that he completed his second mission trip, and he took around three years to complete his second missionary. And Paul really had great enthusiasm and passion for living as an evangelist and as God's witness. Chapter 18, verse 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So straight after his second ministry, he started his third mission trip. He began his third mission trip in Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Here, it's not clear whether Galatia refers to the entire northern Galatia region, which reaches to the Black Sea or not. However, the important thing is wherever he went, Paul always paid attention when the seeds of the gospel are sown and put the same weight as evangelism in making the seeds sprout and grow to bear fruit. This is why Paul makes disciples rather than gathering believers, helping them to know what is right and wrong for themselves on their God and become holy Christians. We also need to go beyond just inviting people to church and really become a channel of the gospel, preach that Jesus is the Christ and tell people that God did cry when we left him and provided us with the ways to reconnect with God. So we should come back to his arms just because he loves us so much. We need to spread love and let people know that God is always wanting to be with us and he loves us no matter what. So we must make those who meet Jesus stand upright as disciples who know the heart of God the Father. Verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. From verse 24 onwards, it's not connected with the verse 23. It's showing different scenes that happened at the same time. It's showing what happened at Ephesus at the time Paul was making disciples at the Galatians. So a Jew named Apollos is introduced here, and this person was a Jew born in Alexandria in Egypt who came to Ephesus. At the time, Alexandria was one of the most well-known cities in Rome, a center of Greek culture and studies, and also a city where a famous Egyptian university and library of ancient documents were located. Apollo, who grew up in such place, he was highly educated in Greek and Hebrew culture, grammar, rhetoric, astronomy, and so on, and he was a very competent person. 
that among the evangelists at the time of the early church, the activities of these Greek Jews were particularly prominent. Even though they were born in other countries, they received thorough legal Jewish education at home, and they were able to speak Greek fluently. So they had great influence in spreading the gospel during the early churches. Verse 25, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. Despite the fact that he was a Jew born in Alexandria, he was well aware of John's teachings and ministry of Jesus that took place in Jerusalem. As we read on, you will see that he was taught well of the Old Testament, listening to his preach in the synagogues, but he did lack some information relating to Jesus. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When we are leading the members of the church, Priscilla and Aquila will be a perfect representation of well-raised saints of the church. These people were led and taught by Paul in Corinth for a year and a half, and they grew and became capable of teaching a scholar like Apollos about the right things under God. We as Christians, we shouldn't stop at a stage where we just take heed whatever is said by the pastor or any leaders, but after learning the Bible for a few years, become those Christians who can teach and deliver the correct message to others and be able to correct the wrong things. We can easily learn more about God and the Bible as long as we spend time reading the Bible and relate the history to help us understand the Bible a bit better. So we should all try to learn God's words properly with the help of the pastor and the leaders of the church. And also the pastor and the leaders, they should help those members to be able to become Jesus' disciples, not that not their own disciples, by de- teaching them the right things. Um, we just have to watch out to not be so reliant on a person, but be able to learn how to connect with God and the Holy Spirit ourselves and think about how we can form deeper relationships with God and ourselves. Verse 27, when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. Apollos was a well-prepared person for God to work through. He knew about the Old Testament really well, and with the help of Priscilla and Aquila, he was able to learn who Jesus was in detail, which prepared him to be able to testify to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ just through normal conversations, and also preach to the extent where where the Jews could not speak. For the Jews at this time, the Old Testament was their only Bible. Although most of the history and events of the Old Testament speak of who Christ the Messiah is, Jews actually did not see Jesus as the Christ, despite the fact that they read the Bible every day. That's why when Paul was preaching about the coming Messiah, they weren't able to completely deny it, but they still felt uncomfortable with the message, therefore wanted to reject Paul and become hostile. But Apollos took a different approach and heard Paul out, compared Paul's preach with his understanding of God to know God properly, and he was not afraid to be wrong or challenged. When we serve and lead members of the church, we should focus on teaching them the God's words and the Bible correctly, who can then stand by the words and change little things in in their life bit by bit, who goes on further and start influencing others and can testify that Jesus is the Christ with confidence rather than just a Sunday Christian. Chapter 19 comes back to Paul's story. Um, Chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. After Paul's team left the church in Corinth, 
Apollos traveled from Ephesus to Corinth and served the church and helped out a lot. And while Apollos was helping in Corinth, at the time Paul was in Galatia and Phrygia region, and then he headed to Ephesus. But the people in Ephesus only knew about the baptism of John. To be honest, if you know John's baptism properly, you should know that Jesus is the Christ and that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us. Even though there were Priscilla, Aquila and Apollos, it can be seen that Ephesus was an unexplored place where the correct word and history have not been properly conveyed. So when Paul obeyed God's order and baptized under the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit came and spoke in tongues and prophesied. If we look back at the Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came for the first time, the disciples obeyed the word of Jesus and waited for the Holy Spirit. And with the presence of the Holy Spirit, they were able to speak in each languages. Secondly, Peter and John were arrested by the high priests, elders and Jewish rulers for healing a person who had a disability with walking in front of the temple. And when later Peter and John were released and prayed that they would act as God's witnesses and will live an obedient life, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and were able to preach more firmly. Thirdly, when all the saints were scattered due to Stephen's martyrdom, Philip obeyed Jesus and preached in Samaria. And Samaritans accepted the word of God and when Peter and John went over to pray for them, the Holy Spirit was there. Lastly, when Peter saw a vision and obeyed the words of Jesus, he went to the house of Cornelius, the centurion in Rome, and preached the words. Everyone that was there experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit and the same things happened in Ephesus too. These events, when the Holy Spirit was present, it proves that the Gospels preached by the disciples are true and therefore the Trini, Trinity God is real. And also the presence of Holy Spirit is a sign that God's continually working through the people who are willing to obey. So the fact that Jesus is the Christ and that God's promises will all be achieved is proved by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now in the Ephesus area, Paul begins to preach the gospel with the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. So as he always has, he first goes to the synagogue to preach the gospel. Verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Unlike how Paul was threatened by the Jews three weeks into preaching in Thessalonica, the Jews in Ephesus weren't as strict Jews. But in the end, the results were the same. Verse 9, But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. In three months, Paul would have told more than 12 times exactly how God has been working through the Bible in history, but there were many people who did not change, even after hearing the news of the gospel. The reason is that they closed their hearts. Closing their hearts meant that despite hearing the word and understanding it sufficiently, they chose not to believe it and reject it. With a closed heart like that, you can't really obey God. That is why we, who easily forgets all the great and precious grace received from God, we need to remember the grace from God and always be awake and keep it in the center of our heart. When people go to a foreign country, normally they have fearful and trembling heart to a new situation and the door to the gospel opens wide open. And even those who did not really believe God before during this time will open their hearts. And this is the time we have to do well. Being in a new environment is also a great opportunity for God and the Holy Spirit to soften people's hearts. This could be a chance to hear what was not heard before and set some goals and challenge yourself. This is how Holy Spirit works in us and gives us opportunities to stay closer to God. So once your heart's open and ready to accept God and live accordingly, you need to try very hard not to go back to the old state.
and keep it up. People do adapt to new environments quickly. That's why when the fear of new things disappear and friends are made and have adapted to new life patterns, the humble mind that you had turns into more stubborn mind and that closes your heart to God. Then it becomes even harder for you to open your heart back to God. That's why God softens our heart through changes in circumstances and environments. So while our hearts are widely opened, we need to have the right attitude in life and learn how to live by the word of God with faith. Otherwise, no matter how old you are, how young you are, once you close your heart to God, you will just end up pulling an excuse to everything and not meditate on God's words. And with a closed heart like that, there will also be no spiritual growth. So distance yourselves from the evil, be wise and act good. And have a soft heart and just keep going. <laughs> Chapter 19, verse 9 and 10. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. For the two months that Paul was in Ephesus, his focus wasn't on gathering people and making them interested. It was purely preaching God's words and teaching them. Although I do repeat this over and over again, any church really needs to prioritize and focus on teaching people of the Bible and not be so sidetracked in gathering people and building fancy churches. Because there's no point in gathering people if God's message isn't getting across. Sudden dramatic changes in our life may change our way in life, but it does not necessarily provide us with the power to go in that direction. However, even though there might not be that much of a dramatic change in our life instantly, as long as we keep on meditating on the Bible and turn God's words into our values and attitudes that we take in life, it gives us the energy to live with faith and follow God. It's when you obey God and live with faith that the Holy Spirit works through you and uses you to achieve God's promises. Verse 11 and 12. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illness, illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. So here all Paul did was to teach the word of God sincerely, but because he chose to obey God and prove to people that the Bible is true, God backed Paul up with these signs of miracles and really worked through him. So what we have to do is teach the words faithfully and obey according to the Bible, rather than trying to perform miracles or changing people's lives then God will show you that the Bible is correct and he will do his work. As they continue to teach correctly, the work of the Holy Spirit continue to prove that the teachings were correct. So the people of Ephesus feared God and their false lives began to change. Verse 19 and 20, A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they... When they calculated the values of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So the cause of the revival in Ephesus was not Paul's power or authority, but it was revived by the word of the, God, of the Lord. So we need to believe in the power of God's word. Just because people are not responding or rebelling the message, that doesn't mean we have to find something to please them or say something that they want to hear. We need to always remember not to add or subtract anything from the Bible and tell them the correct message, God's unchanging and sincere heart, even if that means people will mock us or swear at us, because that's our role and that's what we have to do. Paul just constantly teach the Bible and delivered God's heart. But because he taught them right 
And despite the fear, he continued to preach. So God helped Paul by causing these miracles, showing signs, and eventually reviving the people and the city. For our cell ministry in 2021, let's not forget Paul's heart and his attitude and really learn the Bible for ourselves and spread the gospel. This is not only about giving information about the Bible, but in the name of the Lord, devote ourselves to feeding the word of God that allows the soul to grow and grow fully with the heart of God who loves the soul. And in order to do that, we must live a holy and right life following the words of the Bible ourselves, teach others without addition or subtraction so that they will learn the correct message from God. With the help of God, Paul preached in Ephesus for almost two years. Paul started off with three weeks and then one on two months and then stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. And then in Ephesus, he stayed there for two years. As you can see, Paul started staying in one place for a longer period of time, teaching and preaching people. And in order to change or influence people, we need a lot of many years. Same goes with spreading the gospel. So don't expect them to change instantly and hope that the gospel will grow in the right soul. Give time and faith and constantly put in effort with love and hope that one day we can influence one person in a way that leads them to God. And we shouldn't be disappointed when the person doesn't change. As long as we keep putting in the effort, it's up to them to whether accept God or not. And we shouldn't feel guilty even if they don't. And God will work through us and approach them. So how much time and effort do we spend to learn the Bible? Or even invest in trying to deliver God's words correctly to build up one soul? Most Christians nowadays think that the Bible is very difficult. Not sure why, but a lot of people find the Bible hard and boring And that sort of leads them to be distant from the word of God, which then makes them think that maybe it's not necessary or important for them anymore. As a result, they stop trying to know more about God. And being ignorant of the Bible means that Satan is in a good state to play with us at his will. There's only one reason we feel that the Bible is hard, because that's because we weren't taught and didn't learn much. We didn't spend enough time and didn't bother trying to learn it correctly. You'll never find it easy if you don't even try to know about it. But as long as you have the will to know more about God and how he works through us, then you will find the Bible like a letter written to you from God in order for you to live a blessed life in faith. There are people who say it's difficult to always listen to, summarize, and meditate on words of God. That's because we're not used to it and not really in the habit of doing it. If you think about it, if we attend the service once a week, that's just half an hour of learning the Bible a week. Even if we listen to the sermon for an hour, it's still only 52 hours a year. 52 hours a year, that's definitely not enough time spent to learn about anything. And if we don't meditate on the sermon or share our thoughts within the cell, no matter how long we attend church, we'll never know the Bible properly in depth. So what are the real results of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? In the book John, chapter 16, verse 13, They refer to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Truth. When we're baptized and filled with such a Spirit of Truth, the first thing that appears to us is to rejoice the truth. How sincere and joyful were we when we first received grace from God? Pretty sure there were times when we were longing for God's Word, and that was our top priority. The proof of true baptism of the Holy Spirit is that you are always thirsty for the words of God until you fully understand the words and that you try to live according to the Bible. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, also a spirit that brings God's people closer to the Bible. On the other side, Satan is a spirit that deceives the word of God as difficult so that people don't know the true heart of God. It influences people to take the Bible lightly and stops people from meditating and learning the words properly, keeps emphasizing only on the feelings. 
This is why we need to stay close to the Bible at all times, no matter what happens. The Bible does not get read by itself. We must live a life of obedience in which we choose reading the Bible as our priority in life and always read, listen, meditate on the Word and practice what we have learned. The book Deuteronomy chapter 17, when we... When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to reveal the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. It says to record, keep it close to you and read, learn and practice forever. Listening to the sermon, learning the Bible, and practicing God's words in our life does not come by itself. We must have the will to practice in our life and obey God. Therefore, those who receive salvation with God's grace will need to obey with faith and try their best in practicing the Bible in our lives. Chapter 17, verse 20, And not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites, and turn from the Lord to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. When we obey God's word, there are definitely his blessings given to us. So do not fear obeying God, and really know the blessings God gives to us, or give to those who obey God. So whether the blessing is given to us now or later, anticipating God's blessing gives us hope and courage in life. So rather than some kind of delusion that you expect from God, learn and know the blessing promised for those who obey and anticipate for it while living with God. Live according to the word of God, you will surely experience the wonderful blessings that God has already prepared. Prioritize investing in reading, listening, meditating and sharing the word. And I pray that you will live a wonderful and blessed life by practicing the word that the Spirit of Truth has made you realize.